Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War Two TV and a rare Saturday show. And we turn we return to the Anzio Beachhead today as Major Matthew Graham returns to continue the story of the First Armored Division in Italy. Tanks, tactics, and terrain. What's not to like? I'll bring him in now. Good morning, where you are, Matthew. How are you today? Hey, good morning, Paul from uh, sunny El Paso, Texas. Doing good today. Uh, hope you're feeling uh, better too. I'm, I'm feeling sick as a dog, but whatever. The show must go on. And you know, remind us where for those who didn't see the first show, what we briefly what we covered last time. It was, it was Salerno, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. So we covered the division's participation in the Salerno landing, so Operation Avalanche. It's uh, part of the division's landing there, and then it's kind of movement up the boot uh, to the the Gustav line. And the kind of actions around Mount Porcaccio with the 6th Infantry uh, and then basically kind of the stalemate there in January. And then we left off last time with the combat commander for the 1st Division getting staged for the, the landings for Anzio. And I'm assuming, as in, in the modern military, the Anzio beachhead is ripe for discussion because there are things that worked very well and there are things that didn't work so well. Lessons had not been learned from previous campaigns. Some lessons were. So I'm assuming it, you learn more from the things that don't go well in some ways than you do from the things that go superbly. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, it's absolutely a fair comment. You know, there's a number, you know, doing the research for this uh, presentation and talk, like there are a number of, you know, contemporary studies still on Anzio from across the joint force, at least in the U.S., from the Navy, from the Army, people looking at like from the strategic level to the operational level of like Lucas's command of the beachhead down to the tactics that were used to the intelligence that like drove the landing and why they thought they could get away with, you know, so few troops kind of going into there. What was the intent? What drove it? Yeah, it's absolutely rich for it. And at the end of our and our thing, I'll kind of bring up some of those lessons that the contemporary military takes away uh, or can take away from Anzio uh, from the historical record itself. Well, brilliant. Well, over to you and folks far away with questions. We want to kind of keep it nice and interactive and um, we'll, we'll learn about this. The, the, I think it's our first show on armor on the Anzio Beachhead for a while. Um, so uh, over to Matthew. Yeah. Hey, uh, so good morning, uh, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are uh, watching the world. My name is Major Matthew Graham. I'm the uh, command historian for the 1st Armored Division. Uh, been in the service about 13 uh, years now. I do this as a side uh, additional duty. Uh, to my normal job, which is an operational planner. Uh, I'm an armor officer by trade, uh, graduated from the Virginia Military Institute, uh, commissioned into the active duty U.S. Army, and have served in various roles uh, from platoon leader up to operations officer uh, in armor and cavalry uh, formations. Got a couple of master's degrees from the Command General Staff College, a uh, master's degree from University of Texas El Paso, mostly in international studies and uh, national security. Uh, and then I do this as a hobby because I've written on I did one of my master's thesis on tanks and the tanks and the surf. So tanks and amphibious operations is kind of like right up my uh, my wheelhouse. Uh, that's me. And so before we go any further, let me just put the disclaimer out. Um, anything that is present in the slides or that we talk about in the conversation are my opinions alone. Any errors are mine. Uh, and any of those expressed opinions don't necessarily represent the opinions of the United States Army, the DOD, or any other entity of the, the federal government. Uh, so with that, let's uh, move on. All right, so here's kind of the general agenda that we're going to look at. Introduction, we kind of were one of that. We're going to look at the preparations for Anzio, kind of what drove it from the operational and strategic level, and then go into the landings themselves, uh, where 1A, 1AD kind of, or First Armored Division comes into the beachhead, what that looks like at the initial attempt to expand the beachhead on January 30th, and that's the attack kind of up the Alban Road towards the Colio Lazalia or the Alban Hills, as I'll refer to them from now on because my Italian is terrible. Uh, life in the beachhead and the stalemate, and then towards the breakout um, on the 23rd Operation Buffalo. And then we kind of close out with uh, lessons learned, both at the time historical and then like what the contemporary military can kind of take away from this. Okay, so all good historians to kind of cite where they get their information. There's a plethora uh, of information, folks, if you're looking out to learn more about the Anzio beachhead. Most of these are either official histories or like in the case of the stuff uh, on the Germans are, you know, their interviews after the war, the allies did a really big roundup of, of German officers and senior officials after the war and did extensive interviews. So like the defense of Anzio Beachhead from the German perspective, Kesselring, you know, survives the war. He gives interviews to the intelligence section and all this gets written down. So it helped kind of 
inform how we do this. So you really get some primary documentation, primary source data from that. Uh, there's also a lot of great uh, information uh, based coming out of the armor school in the 1940s, guys who were at Anzio um, that go back, you know, they commissioned, went to the war and then came back and needed to do the professional development and then wrote their monographs or their class papers on the actions of these units uh, in the beachhead. Okay. So let's start off with where we're, we're sitting. Like we talked in the introduction, so 1st Armored Division lands at Salerno uh, in 43. They move up the Italian boot. They're mostly in reserve. There are some, some actions, particularly with the armored infantry elements. Uh, Six Armored Infantry Regiment you know, goes and does the attack under Task Force Allen at Mount Porcaccio, just south of the Gustav Line to try and open up the Leary Valley. But essentially, the 5th Army gets stalemated uh, along the Gustav line just outside of Monte Cassino. 1st Armored Division is in reserve, waiting for this magical exploitation that, you know, we're going to seize Cassino, we're going to cross the Rapido, seize Cassino, and that's going to open up the Leary Valley, and then we can drive uh, straight to Rome. Well, you know, as that stalemate sets in in the winter of 43 going into 44, the strategy looks to shift and open up that, you know, that line of defense by flanking it from the sea. And that's where Operation Shingler or Anzio comes into kind of reemerges from this idea. It had originally been an idea by Churchill and the British to conduct amphibious landings. It kind of got scrapped uh, in 40, late 40 or early 43. And it comes back to life here due to the stalemate. But specific to the 1st Armored Division, uh, you can see the Commanding General Ernest Hammond. He takes over the division in Tunisia after the failures at Kasserine and leads the division all, all the way through uh, into the basically north of Rome. Uh, and then he gets uh, tasked to go lead the 2nd Armored Division in Normandy. But combat soldier through and through, old cavalryman, basically he's called the other Patton in, in some, some literature. Very aggressive, very, uh, very aggressive commander, indoctrinated in the ways of like armored mobile warfare. You see the command structure there. By this time, the division's sitting at about 14,000. It's one of three heavy division, heavy armored divisions uh, in the army, uh, which means it's got about 263 tanks divided into two combat commands. One on the left, Combat Command A, is commanded by a, a colonel. You can see his name up there, Colonel Lambert. And then Combat Command B, commanded by Brigadier General uh, Frank Allen, where you get the Task Force Allen name from. Interesting interesting command dynamics uh, in in the 1st Armored Division. Hammond later writes in his, his autobiography, uh, which you can find in the source data there, that he can't stand Allen. He thinks he's an incompetent commander. He can't, he doesn't like him. Um, and so, but he, li he likes and trusts Lambert. He's, he's very competent, very much like uh, uh, Harmon. And so when Anzio comes up, you'll see one of the combat commands go um, not just based on logistics, but also probably a little bit of leadership. And so you can see how personalities can matter and affect how we, how we do uh, operations. Okay, so that sets the division. So really, as we get ready to go to Anzio, you're going to see the division headquarters. So Harmon's going to be in the beachhead, along with most of Combat Command A for the majority of the actions at Anzio until the breakout when Combat Command B will be brought into the beachhead around April timeframe, and then we'll help with the full division launch the breakout up the Alpen Road. Okay, so preparations for Anzio. Two things I kind of wanted to talk about. Left, I've got the picture of the Sherman kind of in a state of you know repair as they're getting ready. You know, the terrain and the fighting south of the Gustav line during 43 into 44 had not been conducive to tanks, right? You're fighting one of the worst Italian winners on record. The train is hilly, it's muddy. The Germans are really, really good at defense. You're having to fight these very small tank infantry actions to take and hold positions as you claw your way up the Italian boot. So you're not really getting the chance, kind of like what we talked in our last episode, to get that real big armored push that can then you know strike through, exploit, and then uh, use the mass mobility and firepower of the armored division to its full extent. And so you see a lot of small uh, actions and a lot of, you know, hey, waiting in reserve for this. The other one, the other picture I have on there are a bunch of LSTs loading up for um, Operation Shingle. One of the reasons they only bring Combat Command A in here is strategic, and that is the limited ability of sea lift assets in the Mediterranean theater in early 44, right? Some of the other presenters have kind of talked about that from the strategic level. It's all about shipping. 
Yeah. yeah, shipping, right? So like Normandy is getting ready. Normandy's going to kick uh, or Overlord's going to kick off in six months or so. So, you know, the Joint Chiefs of Staff have prioritized all the shipping is going to Great Britain. It's getting ready for the Normandy invasion. And so they've got limited stuff there uh, in the Med. Churchill essentially directs in order to make Operation Shingle happen, you know, the temporary assignment of LSTs to accomplish essentially the first sea lift, like the first lift of troops onto the beachhead. And then that same transport group will then have to, you know, return back to Naples, load up again, and then go forward back to Anzio uh, to bring in, you know, the reinforcements, which in this case will be Combat Command A, the 1st Armored Division, uh, and then I think the 45th uh, Infantry Division uh, for that. And so when we talk about the landings, well, some of the issue you see is well, why didn't you just bring more, why didn't you have armor there on the beach? And you do, you have the attached tank battalions to 3rd Infantry Division and a couple of the other infantry divisions, but you don't have that hitting power of the full combat command for, for an armored division. And mainly that's because you just don't have the logistics ability uh, to bring that to bear on day on day one of the landings. And that, that has, you know, second and knock on effects to, you know, why maybe, you know, Lucas waits those two or three days after achieving yeah. the landings to continue the attack. It was, it was the recurring theme with James Holland and John McManus is that whether we like Lucas or Clark or otherwise, they are to some extent fighting with one arm tied behind their back in the sense that they aren't coming with all their assets. They can't bring everything in. It's all about if you have this, you can't have that. If you have that, you can't have that. That That is a hard reality of the Anzio landings. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a hard reality of the Italian theater as a whole. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And so it's it's just like, okay, well, what are you going to do? Uh, you know, one contemporary uh, author out of the Naval War College called it a space, time, and resources problem, right? And it's, you don't have the time, you don't have the, the, the geographic space to make these landings happen because Italy is small and it's heavily, it's very restricted terrain, and you don't have the resources that you need to really achieve what you want to do. So... Okay. All right. So the landings kind of already mentioned in the last slide, you know, initial landings go in, it's a nighttime landing. They achieve surprise. So the, and the allies achieve surprise at the beachhead. The Germans had anticipated some landing somewhere, you know, north of the Gustav line, south of Rome, or even potentially north of Rome, but they didn't know exactly where. And so when they do a night landing, which I think one of the third ID, uh, you know, presenters talked about it's like is one of the first night landings. Uh, yeah. I think it was James Holland talked about that. It's like it's one of the first only night landings that they do. Uh, they achieve total surprise. They catch the, the Germans and the Italians off guard, and it's a cake, uh, not a cakewalk, but it's a it's an, almost an unopposed or it's a lightly opposed uh, landing. And so by the morning of that time, you know, they're trying to expand the beachhead. Combat Command A at this time for First Armored is still sitting at Naples on the docks, ready to load the LSTs and LCIs as soon as they come back. Uh, but they're just waiting to get back into the fight uh, here at, 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 at uh, Anzio. Okay, so here's where Combat Command A actually gets in. So they land on or about the 28th. Um, their Advon party, you know, because of the, the German Luftwaffe's attacks onto the shipping and kind of the concentration as Kesselring moves forces, you know, rapidly to, to stop the beachhead or stop the expansion of the beachhead, their recon party gets, uh, sunk essentially in the Harbor. And so they go ashore and they have to reconsolidate real quickly and reorganize. That doesn't really happen until the 29th. Um, and then the 29th, you know, Bravo Company, 81st Recon and Lead, two companies the 80, of the 1st Armored Regiment, and then 1st Battalion of 6th Armored Infantry, uh, and then some uh, an FA Battalion support attack along. You can kind of see it in the middle there along the railroad, uh, this old railroad bank that kind of bisects the Anzio beachhead uh, from your northwest to what be your southeast. It's kind of orient on the terrain here for the audience, you know, You'll see in a couple other slides and the other presenters have talked about it, but this is flat ground, right? This is coastal plain up to the mountains. The Alban Hills are, you know, up in the northwest uh, corner there. And there's only a few pa like uh, passable roads uh, throughout the Anzio beachhead, which really is highlights this challenge of intelligence that the first AD like in uh, six core run into is they think this ground is flat and ergo it's flat, i.e. means it's good for tanks, 
But when they get there, it is muddy. It is ridden with, you know, um, it's not, it's in a room with swamps in the South end, but like small canals and ravines that are like 50 foot deep that basically act as like natural tank ditches. And so the armor and the heavy elements essentially are canalized onto the few improved and unimproved roads uh, in the area. Harmon in his, in his autobiography talks about like, okay, he sees, um, he sees those roads. He sees this like unused railroad track is the kind of the key. If he can get his armor onto that and use that as a, as an avenue of approach, he can get around the main like temporary German defenses that he, that reconnaissance has told him are north of both Capolia and Cisterna. And then he can, he can hit them. Well, again, intelligence is wrong. And most of those German defenses are in front or integrated with those towns. Uh, understanding that the train is going to canalize those armored movements along it. So you can kind of see Combat Command A there just south, um, just the north of the overpass to the northwest of it. You see the arrow. It's, its job during this uh, this moment in the fight on the 29th is to support the 1st British uh, Division, which is driving up the Alban Road. Combat Command A is going to come along on the flank and essentially outflank and encircle uh, those German positions defending what it would be the factory or Aparilia uh, and the Alban Road uh, as it moves up towards the Alban Hills and the high ground to the north. So, so we've got a question from uh, Michael watching. Um, yeah. How do they ensure security during the landings and the post-landing staging of assets as well as integrity of their supply lines? And his follow-up to that was um, in terms of defending the beachhead and the gains made as well as staged assets. Because you know, the, the, the stick that people beat Lucas is, is that, you know, too, too cautious. But you have you have to consider the potential of counterattacks. You have to consider defending the beachhead before you move on and the balance of all that. So have you got to, maybe something you're going to cover in the conclusions later on, but that general first 24 hours, 48 hour period, what's your kind of um, understanding of that balance between moving on and holding, keeping what you've got? Yeah. So I think, I think Lucas is a little cautious, you know, Martin Blumson talks about his, uh, in his command decisions, but he's very critical of, how cautious Lucas is. And in the, on the conclusion slide, Kesselring's chief of staff will essentially say like, hey, we were completely taken uh, by surprise uh, by the landings. So like they achieve surprise and shock. The Allies achieve surprise and shock on the Germans. And Kesselring's chief says, hey, a, an aggressive flying column, which would be like, you know, we would call it a thunder run today, but essentially an armored spearhead or armored penetration you know, could have gotten to the Alban Hills, could have gotten to Rome because we had nothing significant there. Mm. I think to Mike's question, though, it's a balance of Lucas in his orders. And again, Blunson does a really good job of talking about the guidance Mark Clark has given Lucas. Um, and he's like, hey, man, don't stick your neck out. He's like, Clark yeah. says, I did it at Salerno um, and I got in trouble for it. And so I think there's a little bit of I don't know, gun shyness in the command uh, for this, which really doesn't match up to what the intent of the operation is, right? Like operationally, the commander's intent is like, let's outflank the Gustav line. That'll cause the Germans to, you know, be flanked on the left. That'll cause them to say, I've got to displace, otherwise I'm going to get encircled by, you know, the, I think it's second Corps coming up across the Gustav line along with the British eighth army on the, on the Eastern side of the, of the, of the Pyrenees of the, of the mountains. And that's going to that's gonna open up the, flying, the front again, right? But then we don't pair this with this idea of very aggressive action. In any amphibious operation, consolidation of the beachhead is absolutely critical. You've got to build up combat power there in order to strike out. The question is, what is the amount of combat power and how do you balance that against your tempo of operations, right? And we talked about tempo in the last uh, yeah. video. I think it's all important. It's like, when do you know you have the initiative? And when do you know, hey, I'm going to assume a lot of risk as a commander to continue my operational tempo, to continue to drive, to keep the enemy on his heels. Um, from a practical standpoint, I think how Lucas, uh, I think well, how the allies are able to build up the beachhead uh, and then maintain those assets that are staged for that second lift is air superiority. Yeah, absolute total, almost almost total air supremacy over the battlefield. The German Luftwaffe comes in, you know, at, throughout the rest of the battle uh, in more force than they've pretty much ever seen, you know, since Sicily. 
uh, and you know starts to wreck the beachhead. This is where you see the first uh, you know radio control bombs get employed yeah. here at the Anzio landing. Uh, but they're sink they're mostly concentrated on shipping because they're no they know if we can sink the shipping, we can, can we can constrain the logistics and then we can deny the ability of the allies to to see lift off the beachhead if that if that becomes a necessity. But really, the amount of air power that both the historical records and what the Germans talk about that the Allies are able to bring here, like the Germans do not have a good reconnaissance picture of what the Allies are, are bringing in. They're able to mass artillery and the, the records will tell you about like how many German pieces. I think it was like 703 pieces of, you know, from 105 millimeter to the 280 millimeter like Anzio uh, Annie railroad gun. They're able to bring in mass artillery, but they don't know where to really shoot that if it's not observed right and so they're limited to calling in that indirect fire by their physical observation posts you know in the alban hills in the high ground to the north of the beachhead that really deprives kessel rain of like key intelligence of when you know they're built they're really building up they have indicators and so that's where you kind of see in the later part of the battle uh you know, the, the the allies are getting ready to attack and then the Germans essentially attack right before them because they're they're both kind of sensing where the other is in their strength and they're trying to preempt, uh, preempt that. Mike, did that answer your question? I know that was like a super long diatribe on a thousand other things, but did that answer I, your question? I'm sure it did. Well, we'll, we'll hopefully they'll respond in the comments there. And, it, you know, the, the, the air power aspect, I'm glad you brought it up because the air power aspect is, is the other argument about air power is, and James Holland made this point, is the whole point, those who don't think it was worth going up through the soft underbelly, is that if you do get those Fosier airfields, you can get that strategic bombing towards more war into Germany. So there's air power from various reasons is is an important part of the Anzio story and sometimes gets overlooked in the drama of the Rangers and the first special service fourth and force and the factory and, and those kind of things. But it, it's all, it's what well, I said earlier, it was all about shipping. It's all about shipping and air power and what's happening on the ground. It always is. Yeah. And I, and I think from a strategic, so like Hollins talks about that from a strategic perspective, like you get yeah. the bases North of Naples so you can run strategic bombing into Southern Germany and hit most of the production stuff. That's not in the Ruhr. I think this, though, highlights the, the, the importance of like tactical air power. So in the time, every field army has a t number tactical assigned air force. I think, and I'm probably going to get this wrong, and it'll get correct in the comment section, somebody Wikipedia for me. I think it's the 12th tactical air force is supporting uh, Fifth Army. But their ability to mass, you know, P-47s, P-51s, A-26 attack bombers, you know, almost on call is really amazing and the amount of preparatory fires uh we bring to the beachhead in the later attacks when it's successful uh is is absolutely amazing you know Harmon talks about the ability of american artillery to do time on target which is this thing that gets highlighted over and over again but in in real quick summation it's the ability to bring in different caliber artillery to bear on a target at a single time right so you have multiple batteries firing yeah. at different angles and different times but it's all impacting it's massing on one place and the ability to coordinate that with air power and then have tactical air power on call essentially with the armored columns and sometimes with the infantry divisions that really helps uh you know turn this fight later uh as we go towards the breakout brilliant Thank you. And, and you did answer Michael's question perfectly. He said, in fact, he used the word perfectly. So there we are. So uh, back to you. Okay. okay. So so this is, I just want to go back to this 1st Armored Division. So 1st Armored Division, Common Command 8, goes up here. This creates, and you can kind of see the dashed line on the map there, in conjunction with the 1st uh, oh, British God. Division, um, which, you know, it's the Irish Guards, the King's Soft Fear Light Infantry. Woody, help me with the help me with the the British Shropshire stuff. Light Infantry. I think Shropshire it's Light Infantry. Thank you, sir. My yeah. my British friends will be angry at me. Uh, they're able to secure essentially what is a a bulge in in the beachhead. Yeah. You can kind of see it there, and it's really following that Alban Road line up towards Campania, um, and they're able to secure that by the thirtieth. And that's the most promising area that the six corps as a whole has to really getting out of the initial lodgement area. And in, in current doctrine, you call it the initial lodgement and the expansion of the beachhead. This is the chance for them to expand the beachhead, you know, less than a week after the landings. So, okay. So we kind of talked that a little bit. So 31st, so after that, uh, 
that attack goes in combat command a as it rolls up the the bowling alley or that abandoned railroad line runs into three major things that we'll talk about in a, another slide but it, you see it here first mines mud and artillery right mm -hmm. all the flat ground basically means as you attack from the south and you can see it on the topographical lines of this map the germans are defending from well either covered and concealed positions or strong points made out of these Italian stone farmhouses. And these things are basically bunkers, right? It takes yeah. concentrated fire from artillery or direct fire from the, the, the Sherman tanks or light tanks um, or self-propelled guns to destroy these emplacements as they move up. And the second problem that I kind of talked about in the last one was the ability to maneuver off of the ground. The intelligence said, hey, this ground is great for tanks. Really, it's not. They're stuck on the roads and they're stuck on these unimproved trails. And every time they try and get off of it, they get stuck in the mud. Uh, again, Harmon talks about the division, you know, on this attack, sending up, you know, a company of tanks and three of the tanks get stuck uh, and he needs to he wants to extract them. So he sends another company up there and they all get stuck or blown up. Uh, and it's like, man, it, it is just not great ground for tanking, so to speak, here in January of uh, January, February of 44 at the Anzio Beachhead. So plan changes. Uh, new plan now is, you know, first British division has had some success driving up towards Capolia uh, and the railroad junction there, along with the Alban Road linkages up to the north. So the now the thing is first British division is going to attack to seize Oak Australia uh, again apologize for my Italian pronunciations. And then 1st Armored Regiment of the 1 AD is going to fall on, uh, is going to conduct a forward passage alliance through them to exploit uh, their penetration uh, of the German defenses. That occurs, but essentially they culminate. Um, they offensively culminate at Copolia. They run into much stronger German defenses. I already kind of mentioned the Germans are defending forward of those lines, uh, a forward of the Cisterna and forward of Copolia. Uh, along these, uh, along that line, and where intelligence had thought they'd been behind it, and because of that, they the the offensive runs out of steam, you know, before it can achieve its objective, and so we eventually culminate there. And culmination is a is a military term to say, hey, you've lost basically the ability uh, to continue the operation as you as you intended. So if you're on the attack, culmination is you can't continue the attack. You have to transition to the defense or to some other part or or withdraw because you can't continue to do you know what you're trying to do and that's based on combat power you know logistics you know casualties any number of things in this case it's combat power and casualties uh, or excuse me it's just it's combat power they're running out of they're taking more casualties than they anticipated and they're not getting the breakthrough and night is coming and this is an actually interesting doctrinal thing so I found this in my original research for my tanks and amphibious operations. I was curious, like, why these tanks in a couple of other battles in World War II, like in the the, the Luzon campaign uh, or the Lady campaign, excuse me, you know, these these armored columns would go forward. They would penetrate, you know, a defense somewhere and then they would be like, OK, we don't have infantry support. We're going to withdraw back and bivouac before nightfall. And I was like, well, why are they withdrawing at night? That doesn't make any freaking sense to me as a, as a modern military guy. I'd be like, hold what you got. Like just circle up the tanks and defend your perimeter. Don't give up ground you've already paid for. Well, doctrinally, basically the doctrine at the time told armored commanders, like you cannot defend your position at night. Like you must have infantry support. You must withdraw uh, to a bivouac area uh, you know, before nightfall. Tanks can't do it at night. You're too easily infiltrated. And so you see this again of how doctrine is influencing battlefields for the negative because, you know, hey, if we had just continued the attack after night, perhaps we would have gotten, you know, Capoli, we would have broken the German defenses or found a way to, you know, uh, outflank them. But nope, nightfall comes, tank, got, tanks got to go, tanks got to go back home and, and do recovery and maintenance. It's just really interesting to me. Um, but that's a random sidebar. Anyways. But just come on that subject, because yeah. you're talking about fighting alongside the, the British um, infantry. So Ian is asking, was the first AD used to working with British infantry and vice versa? Was British infantry used to working with American armor? Yeah, they, they were. So again, Harmon talks about it uh, in his, they had worked together in North Africa uh, a little bit during the Tunisian campaign, particularly when the, they go into Bizerti. Um They hadn't worked together in Sicily. They'd worked together uh, kind of in the Salerno campaign, but not as much as they did in North Africa. And so yes and, and no uh, to that. For the, for the British standpoint, 
you know, they're using all the same equipment. They're, you know, common language, common yeah. radio. So they, yeah, they, they the understand same how to use it. Yeah. Um, and then another question, just, you know, you talked about the, the intelligence aspect about the terrain and what have you. And Benjamin Allen is saying, it's a very good point. How can intelligence make such a huge mistake? It's Italy. We aren't talking about the relatively unknown Pacific here. And it, yeah. you know, when you think about the fact in the Pacific, we're already by 1944, we're starting to employ the Alamo scouts. We're sending recon to islands, things like that. And this is remote Pacific islands. How could we basically fuck up so badly? Given that we've already been in Italy for months already, it's not it, it, uh, the the failure to understand the terrain and the canalization and the dikes and the swamps. It is it inexcusable? I want to say a little bit of yes, honestly. <laughs> from from like no, from a modern military perspective. So like in modern intelligence, right, or, or in modern like military planning, you ideally want to have multiple forms of intelligence that confirm yeah. or deny what you're trying to do, right? So like, say you have a, a priority information requirement, like, hey, what are the road conditions in the Anzio beachhead, right? Like, what a, what is the terrain like in the Anzio beachhead? Well, ideally, you would have, you know, aerial reconnaissance, and they would take pictures, and then you would have people that are specially trained to figure out like, oh, yeah, well, that that is actually a da drainage ditch. It's like 50 feet wide, yeah. and it, you know, it's soft ground. Um, and then ideally, you know, and let's take it for World War II or, or continuing the story. Like you would ideally say, okay, that's interesting, but let's confirm that. So let's, let's send in some special operators, you know, let's send in some SF guys or, you know, we have and, other that, and that's, I was going to just jump in there. Yeah. It's not like this beachhead doesn't have lots of those specialists. You've got British commandos, you've got American airborne, you've got the first special service force, you've got the ranger battalions there. You've got specialist forces who are good at doing that infiltration recon out on the ground in small groups thing they're they're in in that's the that's the one s asset i would say you have in massive strength in the enzo beach and yes maybe you haven't got enough armor maybe there isn't enough artillery yet but you absolutely do have a lot of specialist forces so you know why couldn't they have broken up the range of battalions and put a few companies in as scouts ahead of the first armored? i mean you're telling me no it doesn't work like that woody that's not how the army works but that, that's me asking it no, it's, it's it's a valid question, Woody. It, I think, so it's a compromise, right? So commanders are always in charge of, you know, risk versus risk and resources yeah. and priority. I think Lucas and Fifth Corps um, and Mark as an overall prioritized the uh, element of surprise over anything. And so they assumed risk by having, by only having limited forms of intelligence by that. I, to the, to the gentleman's question, like, aerial reconnaissance of the beaches like aerial photography they looked at the roads they looked at them they said okay we think this is this is good but in order to achieve surprise you don't want to put in those recon forces right you don't want to send a, a platoon of of rangers to anzi or natuna because heaven forbid they get compromised or captured then you're going to then the germans are going to know oh hey something's up right and you see this in normandy right the raids on calais the the cross channel stuff you do it in multiple places to make the enemy think like, okay, where are they really going here? Because the resource constraints, you don't really have that ability. Um, and there's only a few places on the Italian coast that you can kind of land. And so if you send those, you know, dismounted scout special reconnaissance forward, you, you run the risk of compromising the landing beaches and you run the risk of, okay, now I'm not going to achieve surprise because the Germans are going to know something's up and they're going to send people down there. Um, and then I'm going to have an opposed landing, which is not what I want. Why I said it was inexcusable, and this is what I don't understand. There's a there's a battle report by somebody on the 81st Reconnaissance Battalion out of 1st Armored. And what I don't understand is one of, that's one of the lead elements that lands after uh, 3rd ID and I think 40. I think it's, uh, I think it's 35th uh, Infantry, but correct me if I'm wrong on that one. I don't understand why they didn't aggressively scout the ground um you know forward for these the attacks it's a, it's a technique that we see later in the breakout um you know you have infantry uh, i was just i was just reading about it in a, in a battle report here like a, a special unit called the 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 red brigade or the red platoon or the red red company and they ride on tanks and they are dismounted infantry scouts mm -hmm. that go forward and you know conduct they're specially trained in patrolling and infiltration and they're designed to proof the lanes for these armored you know counter these armored attacks and so I don't have a good answer for why the the ground reconnaissance wasn't more aggressive uh, once the landing uh, happened. And I think that probably goes back to Lucas 
not wanting to stick his neck out, wanting to build up combat power before he got into a fight that he really didn't mm -hmm. know what was going on because he was really kind of groping in the in the dark yeah. a little bit. Hope that answers the question. Kind of I, well, I did, and I had a kind of a, the opposite point of view. Uh, the Germans did counterattack and hold ground. We perhaps didn't think they were going to. He said that the last thing they expected was Germans sending divisions from their scant reserves, and they would thought they would have to fight uh, on that terrain in order to advance. So, you know, the idea that we couldn't really have predicted that the Germans were going to thrust all the stuff, the Hermann Goering division, everyone else forward. Um, yeah. the, maybe the belief was... The Allies only encountered those later on in the campaign, by which time we brought in our resources. And, you know, it's, we said at the beginning that, that this, that Yanzio Beachhead is, is rife for discussion. That's, there are yeah. lots of things that are, are interesting, but I, mean, I feel we're derailing it now with questions. No, it's, so it's, let's, let's... I'll bring it back. Uh, Harmon talks, so like, uh, Brigadier General, or excuse me, Major General Harmon, the commander of 1 AD, when the initial planning for this goes in, and it says like, hey, this is this is not a good idea. Like it, the, the landing in general, um, he's like, we're not bringing enough, you know, armor to the beachhead, right? You got to bring the tanks. You got to bring them on the first lift so you can have that that punching power out of it. Um, and so that's kind of the this like the commanders are not really on board. But, you know, Mark Clark's under a lot of pressure from Alexander, under a lot of pressure from the political leadership uh, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time to like, hey, open up something uh, in Italy. Because the Allies think, well, they'll just pull line, like this is the, you know, classic Napoleonic kind of thinking of like, well, if he's strong on his right, therefore he's weak on his left. And the Germans, instead of you know, weakening the Gustav line in front of Casino, which is already strong just by the natural defenses of it, like, well, oh, obviously they'll pull forces from the Gustav line to there. That's a key assumption that was, that didn't really have anything to verify to turn it from an assumption into a fact. And that's the challenge of, hey, I've got these intelligence, I've got these planning assumptions I've made as a planner, and I'm gonna assume the Germans will pull forces from the Gustav line to, to counter the Anzio Beachhead. Well, what happens if the Germans just, you know, flood Italy with, you know, all these reserve divisions from the North and, and from uh, Yugoslavia and South of France and to counter this, to get a victory? And it's like, well, uh, well, I hope they don't do that. So and it's like, well, hope's not a really great planning methodology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, good, 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 good questions and good answers. And thanks everybody for your your, your comments. It's always fun when there's as much going on in the sidebar as there is in the actual main the main show. But but back to Matthew. Yeah. All right. So uh, we left the first AD, you know, south of the Alban Hills, uh, around the village of Capulia. They've culminated. At this point, you know, Lucas recognizes, hey, I have kind of sent to the, I have expanded the beachhead to the point where I think my forces are, I, I have, I as a core commander have culminated. I need to get prepared to transition the defense. And one of the key things of a defense is having a, a core, a core reserve, you know, an element that can respond to penetrations in the defensive line or stop breakthroughs. So he pulls combat command A uh, back to that, and they're going to go stage uh, in the woods south of the overpass and then essentially become the rapid reaction or the QRF force for the Anzio Beachhead. Okay, uh, we talked about Capulia, and I just want to give the audience, this is the kind of terrain. So as the audience is looking at this, you're looking at this from the German perspective. So you're looking north, south, towards the factory on your right, the railroad beds, the highway, and then Anzio would be off to your north, uh, northwest with the Tyrrhelian Sea behind it. And so it really highlights the challenge of terrain that 1AD uh, is having to fight with because they're under observation the whole time. They're restricted to the road, so it's pretty easy for the Germans to put both anti-tank fire and uh, artillery fire uh, on them. With that, you know, uh, from a from a technical standpoint, from a tanks on tanks type thing. So, like most of the tanks you see here are M4 Shermans, uh, the A2s, and A I think it's the A2 variants, uh, and then Stuart light tanks. You're facing off mostly against German Mark IVs, but also you're facing off an increasing amount of Mark V. Uh, so Tigers and Panther uh, tanks you're facing here. So you've got the long barrel 88 millimeter guns, which, you know, given this terrain, right, that's a really great field of fire for something with the reach and power of an 88 millimeter, uh, both in the Tiger and the, and the Panther holes. So, okay. So, the engagements, the Germans realize, hey, you know, in order to crush this beachhead, because uh, the Fuhrers come down and said, hey, 
I want this thing eliminated, right? Not just, you know, contained, but eliminate the beachhead. So the Germans realize they've got to continue the attack. So on the right flank, you've got the third, uh, third Panzer Grenadier uh, division that's going to be the main adversary for both the first British uh, and then the first armored uh, as its reserve, because most of the first armored as the core reserve is going to get committed by company and battalion strength to this fight around the factory, the Apulia factory. But I really want to highlight the muds, mines, and engagement area that we had. So one of the things you read from the battle uh, reports is every time they either get off the roads, they get stuck in the mud, or they get stuck in a minefield. And that is, and they don't really have good uh, minefield clearing equipment at the time. They later develop techniques that we would see in, in the modern military as like line breach charges and that type of thing to breach these minefields on the move. Uh, but they don't have it here. So they get stuck in minefields and then it's having to clear those out or having to pull back. And so it really slows down their operational uh, tempo. You kind of see that in the little, little battle description there. So like four companies get committed here, two medium, two light from 1st Armored Regiment to support the 1st British uh, Division uh, against the German counterattacks. Uh, and they lose seven tanks in the process. You know, they get stuck in the mud, they get hit by mines, or while they're trying to recover, they get hit by anti-tank anti fire. And it's funny, the, the quote at the bottom is from a, a report by the Armor School after the war uh, that talks about American armor in the Anzio Beachhead. And it says like the main, the tank has met its primary obstacle terrain. Right. Again, once again, it's maybe, it's not the tank fire. It's not the Panthers. It's not the Tigers. It's the freaking mud. Uh, and that is the challenge that they're going to face here in the winter of 40, uh, 44 of the Anzio Beachhead to getting these tanks to work effectively. So. Brilliant. Okay. So kind of talk the German counterattacks again, Terrain cuts both ways here. So again, first armored, you know, and first British are up uh, along the Alban Road. That consequently is the same path the Germans are going to primarily take to cut the bridgehead in two or cut the beachhead in two because that's the same terrain they got to use. Mark four tanks, uh, Panthers and Tigers, while they may have a little bit cross country mobility better than the Sherman, it's not much better. And so they're just as restricted as as we are to the roads. Um, and so you'll see most of the main attacks, as you can see the salient around uh, the factory is gone by this point. And so you've got an additional attack. The Germans are basically trying to establish a, a line of departure to crush the beachhead, basically running from uh, Aprilia or excuse me, Capulia to Cisterna where the third ID is fighting uh, with the idea of, hey, if we can drive down the Alban road, with our armor, we'll cut it in half. We'll get through the the woods there. That's where one AD is is staged. So one AD is if you're looking at the map, uh, you'll see the wooded area just south of the battle lines. One AD's headquarters is dug in there, and that's where their combat command A is. And they're send, essentially sending out uh, fire teams, you know, tank companies, uh, you know, and and battalion elements to all these little spots along the line, supporting Third ID, supporting 45th Infantry, supporting First British supporting the left flank, you know, wherever they need tank support and direct fire, that's where you'll find the first armored division. And so it's not a really a division fight. It is Harmon's commanding from his, you know, his headquarters there in the, in the woods. Uh, but it's really sending these guys out. And, you know, Lucas calls them the, the division, the firemen of Anzio, because they're the thing that's keeping the beachhead alive. Because every time the Germans hit somewhere with armor or concentrated fire, first armored is right there reinforcing uh, the defense and, you know, helping stabilize the front. Quick question for you, given that you're talking about the command there. Um, we had it earlier uh, from Samuel. Is um, um, Were there any notable incidents of first AD getting naval gunfire support? Seems like it would have been tough to be German within 10 miles of any battleship or heavy cruiser. Is that an asset he's able to bring in? So at least in the initial landings, he's got a pretty substantial task force. Um, I think I've got a book here that kind of lists it out. Hold on. Real quick here, I'll. Uh, no problem. It's all good. I'll get you the what was actually in the supporting force. And folks, don't forget to click like and subscribe while we're waiting for Matthew there. And yep. uh, we we got more shows coming your way too. Monday we've got a myth show with Dan Ellen about um where the RAF bomber command the ma the real masters of the air that'll that'll stir the pigeons up. But back to Matthew now. Yeah, so so the initial landing is supported by about eight, one cruiser, eight destroyers, uh, and various other smaller auxiliary ships. 
that's Task Force X-ray. That's the American landings, the initial ones. Right. And then the, the British were supported by four cruisers and eight fleet destroyers and six uh, smaller destroyers. To the to the gentleman's question, I don't know how long those guys stayed around. I don't know if it, you know because at this point we're talking, you know, three weeks into the landing. You know, we're in early February by this point. Um, you know, first armored has been landed, and those LSTs. I've got an. I've, at least I know the the transports. They've been pulled, right? Like this yeah. is it. Like they get first. They get first armored and forty fifth onto the beachhead, and they're like, we're out. We're. I, we're I feel from what James Holland said, a lot of that support has gone within a, within a couple of weeks. But I I'd be. Yeah. I, corrected if i'm wrong but um and some benjamin said what was the what was the book you were just referring to oh uh so again most of the histories for this one this is a really good publication so this comes out of the center for military history this is the anzio beach it i apologize it's it's ripped because i took it to national training center with me uh so it's been in a it's been a field environment but this has got all that that information and it's sourced from the the larger book which is uh casino to the alps it's the official oh, army yeah. Yeah. yeah so um, okay. You. Yeah, no problem. And so firemen from, uh, firemen of Anzio, you know, this is what first armored is doing. They're acting as the cure ref for the beachhead, keeping the beachhead uh, alive at this point. All right. That can kind of continues. The two pictures on your right hand side kind of show what the first armored's engaged with. So in addition to that mobile striking force to counterattack that I showed you, they're also set in these, you know, essentially bunker positions where they'll have an old farmhouse like you see on the top right picture. They'll bring a Sherman in there and it'll have a set field of fire and it'll stay there essentially as a, as a, as a bunker. Like the crews will switch out. Harmon talks about it. It's like the crews switch out, but the tank stays because it's covering a certain sector supporting, you know, an entrenched infantry company or battalion, you know, on the line. You know, the same thing below, you see a uh, uh, M10 tank destroyer kind of dug in doing the same thing. The other interesting part here that first AD uh, ends up doing is like one of their battalions in the first regiment ends up being essentially artillery. So I mentioned like earlier in the talk, the Germans weight of artillery by just caliber is heavier than ours. We have more, we have more artillery, but we have a shortage of shells going back to the gentleman's question about like, Hey, where is those support assets going? And once we lose, once they get the combat command ashore, those LSTs go. And so you're keeping the beachhead alive, but just enough to keep it alive. You're not really bringing in these like mass stockpiles of equipment yet, at least not in March. Uh, you'll see it later in April when we get ready for the breakout. But at this time, it's just keep the troops alive, you know, keep them feeded with the stuff they need. And so they end up converting uh, putting like wood planks underneath some of these M4 Shermans to see you do indirect fires. I mean, you see this in contemporary uh, battlefields uh, in Eastern Europe as well now, where you'll have tanks that are like, okay, well, we'll it's not really being used as a tank, so let's use it as an artillery piece. Uh, not mm -hmm. the most effective way, but hey, you do a do what you can. A gun band. is a gun is a gun. Yeah, gun's a gun, the gun, right? And it's a 75 millimeter, but it like, hey, it yeah, it does something. So, uh, okay. So this is kind of the station, First Armored Division, again, stage out of the woods there you see on your, your kind of your, just below that dip in the allied line. And yep. they're continuing to reinforce and support those infantry companies as the core or those uh, infantry divisions as the core reserve uh, throughout this time period. Okay, that goes on from March into April. In an April, the decisions made, you know, hey, the weather is improving. We're going to try, we're going to launch Operation Diadem, which is the the new, which, the, which is the Fifth Army's concerted attack along the Gustav line to finally take Casino, open up the Leary Valley and join two core and six core together, like link the bridge, link the beachhead to the uh, the rest of the army. In support of that, Combat Command A, which has been operating south of Casino, kind of doing the same thing in support of the infantry elements trying to cross the Rapido and support the operation south of Monte Casino and in the town, they get sea lifted into the beach hit. And so now Harmon has got his full division here in the Anzio Beach. And he brings another, uh, Lucas ends up bringing another infantry division uh, as well. But for the first armored, you've got both Combat Command A and B now uh, here in the Anzio Beach hit. And the plan that's developed for the for the breakhead or for the breakout is called Operation Buffalo. The key to this is the the weather, really, the weather and the terrain. And so the ground is starting to dry out in early May, so trafficability is massively improving. 
in addition, now you're getting more resources as the, the army has said, we're going to break out of Anzio because we've got to do something. Uh, we can't just continue to allow us to sit here in a stalemate that has participated, that, is, that has happened over the last kind of two months. We've got to get going. So Operation Buffalo is the division, is the core plan. And First Armament is going to be uh, in a basically a two-pronged attack with Third ID. They're going to attack simultaneously uh, both up the Alban Road and into Cisterna. They're going to seize that main avenue approach that links Cisternia and Kapalia. And that's going to be, I think it's Highway 7. That's going to be the main route that they're now going to use to try and trap the German 10th Army between two corps and fifth army in the south on the Gustav line and this, you know, uh, envelopment that's coming out of the Anzio beachhead. That's the idea, at least. So part of that is we've got to get out of the, we've got to break out. So combat command A uh, is over on the left flank uh, right here. Uh, you'll see it kind of left driving up towards the, kind of towards the factory and then up highway seven. Combat command B on their, their right flank and to their right flank is a third ID. This is a little controversial because doctrinally, uh, Harmon argues for no third ID should lead the attack across the front, or at least two infantry divisions should, should lead the attack across the front. And then first ID follows and in, in support and exploits the breakthrough. You shouldn't use a tank force for a breakthrough. Truscott, uh, Lucas Truscott, the former third ID commander who has now taken command yeah. uh, of fifth of sixth corps from Lucas after Lucas has been relieved of command says, I acknowledge that. Yeah, I, I acknowledge that Harmon. Like, I get it. However, this is what we're we're gonna do. Um, and him and Harmon are very similar in aggressive personality. Very aggressive commanders, both of them. Uh, one obviously trusts God's all infantrymen by trade. Harmon is a in a cavalryman. So different perspectives on that, but still very aggressive uh, commanders, both. So now he's got third ID there and first ID, and they're gonna drive through. And this is where I want to I want to drive down to the kind of the tactical level real mm -hmm. quick. This is where one AD uh, receives one of its Medal of Honors uh, for uh, for World War Two, and that on the right, that's uh, First Lieutenant Charles W. Fowler, one ninety first Tank Battalion. He earns the Medal of Honor essentially by single handedly leading a tank infantry uh, company attack through like a, a, a minefield. He finds a platoon of infantry that's stuck there uh, when his tanks come up. He dismounts, he grabs them, he leads them, you know, himself through the minefield, demining this minefield, like clearing a path by himself by picking up landmines and moving them out of the way so he can get this platoon through. Once that's through, he returns back through that, that minefield, gets his tanks, does the same thing with the tanks again, like clears these mines himself, gets his tanks up, um, you know, and drives this this uh, company into the attack. Germans counterattack. The infantry fall back. His tank gets hit. He is, you know, wounded in the process of trying to save his tank uh, tank crew's life. His his tank is basically the last one left on the battlefield. He's providing supporting fire, directing it while providing first aid to his crew, uh, and eventually just the weight of fire overwhelms him. He's got to withdraw back, uh, and he he unfortunately you know uh, dies two or three days later from his wounds, uh, but then he's posthumously awarded the, the Medal of Honor. And I highlight Fowler not just because he's a Medal of Honor winner, but that is the type of fighting that you see throughout yeah. Operation Buffalo is this, the Germans have have heavily mined their defenses all along the, the front. So when we're trying to break through, you've got to clear these minefields somehow. The, some of the battle reports talk about, you know, they develop these things called snakes, which would we, we today would call essentially like line charges, uh, these mickliks that go through, you know, are placed in the minefield and then detonate and clear the mines by explosive, explosive charge, opening up a breach for the armor to come through. They develop different little things. They develop attachments to the tanks to deal with the mud so they can maneuver off, you know, off uh, the roads. All these little, like, really cool little interventions that, that soldiers develop on the baseline to make sure this attack is, is successful. So, and, and do you think that if, if this action is typified for these incredible moments of individual bravery across the armor of the infantry, is some of that born out of the frustration that they have been weeks in the beachhead? dying just to artillery fire so you might as well die doing something proactive and aggressive you know is, is it sort of born out of a bit of frustration as well i think a little bit of it is yeah absolutely you know they most of these guys have been fighting in the beach at least combat command a you know he's been doing this thing for now going on five months um 
Harmon talks about it. And it's a little bit of braggadocious on the American part, just because, yeah. you know, we're all cowboys at heart of, you know, we attack, right? That's what Americans do. Like, we don't like to do defense. Like the fundamental part of our doctrine is offense is the decisive form of warfare. Yeah. That's what doctrinally we said. We'll, we'll have that discussion later at the, the close. Um, but yeah, it, I think it's a little bit is, hey, let's, let's go do this thing. Yep. And I know just going back to when you said about Trust Scott kind of being reluctant to use the third ID um, at the, the, kind of the, in the vanguard of this. I mean, he has seen that when he was divisional command, he has seen that division been through the absolute ring. I mean, the 7th Regiment, you know, were, were taken apart earlier. I can, Charles Truska is one of my favorite commanders of, of, of the American military in World War II. And I, and I can understandly understand him, you know, wanting to give them a slightly, slightly secondary role uh, in this uh, and, and use the armor. Yeah, well, I don't even know if it's a secondary role. I think he sees, you know, he sees you've got to have this combined weight of okay, infantry yeah. and Maybe armor, secondary right? wasn't the right choice of word, but yeah. Yeah. So I don't think he's I don't think he's gun shy with their idea. I think he's like, we've got to give a real heavy punch along the road. Yeah. And the best divisions to do that are our third ID, my old division, and my armored division, the first armored. And if I can do that, I'm gonna break the German line. And as soon as I break the German line, like it's broken field run into the Alban Hills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Okay. I know we're getting close on on time. So Yeah, but we're loving it. We don't care. Okay. Um, I, well, I do want to get to the the last slide. I think that's going to be important. But we talked about the beginning. This is the breakout. All right. So Off Operation Buffalo is successful. Operation Diadem down on the Gustav line is also successful. And so now you've got, you know, two breaks in the German defenses. Here in the Anzio Beachhead, you'll see the 1st Armored Division just south of the 45th uh, there. They're going to skirt the Alban Hills and go through this and, and then meet additional contact in the Caesar line uh, and have to fight through that as they as the Germans begin this retrograde operation, this delay as they move you know north back up the peninsula towards, towards Rome. But 1st AD is trying to support 45th and 34th Infantry as they seize the hill masses of the Alban Hills and the first armor drives around the drives around the flank, and that's both combat commands uh, there, A and B. So, okay, all right. I would be remiss if I didn't tell you, first armor division is the first one to get tanks into Rome on June fourth, nineteen forty-four. Little known fact though, because it gets a lot of uh, overshadowed because of something that Woody's very very familiar with that happens two days later. Uh, you know, in in the Allied world, which is would, the, that, would that be Normandy? Yeah, I think it is Normandy. Did Normandy happen that day? I think it did. Did, did something uh, happen on the yeah. Yeah, there was a something. minor minor excursion to France, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and so we we drive into Rome. Um, the Germans have essentially said, like, hey, let's you know, we are not going to fight for the city. They'll have delaying actions in the city a little bit, but we're going to really withdraw. Uh, north to the Gothic line, which is the next line of defense up by the Arno tied into terrain. And so these are pictures of um, M10 tank destroyers coming into the city. And the first tank is actually from H Company, 13th Armored Regiment. Um, you know, and I love the quote here that Harmon talks about. Th there's this, this enthusiasm of victory. You know, now that we're doing, we've transitioned from a break, a penetration into an exploitation and now we're in a pursuit of the germans and so both second corps and fifth corps are being driven hard by uh, mark clark to just like grab as much as you can now the downside of this is and we'll talk about the last slide is this is very terrain focused right and you'll see this this dichotomy between terrain and enemy focus both on the german side and our side as well but you see the quote there truscott's like tells harm in the division he's like hey push on to genoa if you want like just keep keep going keep the pursuit up get the germans as far north as you can so okay legacy of this and why this is important for you know current military historians so combat command a is a direct lineage of the second brigade uh, second brigade combat team of the first armored division uh today uh, they are over in Europe now supporting uh, supporting Allied uh, and NATO responses on the eastern flank. And some of the, and because they're over there, they had the chance to go down to the 80th anniversary of the Anzio land. And you can see some pictures there. So the, the sign up on the left with some reenactors. On the right, you got the brigade staff doing a staff ride of the battle. Uh, and then, you know, honoring the fallen uh, from the American side there at the American Sanitary at Anzio. Because uh, we end up losing, I think, like... 50,000 soldiers uh, there, but don't quote me on the number. I have to, I have to get that. But, you know, it is, it is a living memory for those in the military 
to understand what our legacy is and how can we learn from it and then how can we take pride in, in the generations that came before us. Okay, historical lessons, and I, I really welcome the audience comments uh, on this one. So you can read the quotes there on the left. I want to highlight those two that I, I said earlier, like, don't stick your neck out, Johnny. I did it Salerno, and it got me in trouble. And so I think some of the issues that we see with Lucas and the employment of the First Armored aggressively drives from Lucas's uh, guidance from Clark that like, hey, don't be too aggressive. There's the great counterfactual that Blumson has in his uh, decision at Anzio about like, well, what if Patton had commanded there? What if somebody more of Truscott had commanded the, the Corps? Would, it, would this have been the same thing? Would it have worked? Would it have achieved the operational objective that they set out to of I, turning the Gustav line and getting the Germans to displays? You know, Lucas later in the war says he felt like being a, a lamb being led to the slaughter because yeah. of the yeah. resource, because of the space, because of the time that he's 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 under. And then the the quote from Kesselring's chief of staff uh, underneath that basically says like, "Hey, the road to Rome was open. Like, why didn't you why didn't you go?" So um, anyway, that leads us into some more contemporary lessons, and this this is terrain and enemy focused. So you know when we do operations you can talk about like, are we trying to achieve terrain or are we trying to destroy the enemy there's this interesting contrast between uh von mackinson and kesselring and clark and lucas uh on on the america or alexander and clark excuse me alexander and clark on the allied side for the allies alexander is incredibly enemy focused he wants to destroy the german yeah. you know 10th army right Clark is much more focused on Rome, very terrain focused. Like let's achieve this terrain because we think the terrain is, you know, critical to achieve our mission. It's kind of similar on the, the other side, like Mackinson, uh, I think commanding 14th army or 9th army is incredibly enemy focused, very aggressive commander. I mean, he's the son of August von Mackinson, a very famous German or Prussian German uh, World War One general on the Eastern front. You know, he's very aggressive, but Kesselring is much more terrain uh, focused, like hold the beachhead, keep the allies where they are. Let's continue to fight this, uh, this attritional war. And that gets me to the next point, attrition versus maneuver. Sometimes attrition works. And I said this in my last presentation, like sometimes weight of artillery fire, weight of air power, weight of numbers matters more than brilliant maneuvering. And in a place like Italy that has restricted terrain, the amount of firepower and resources you can bring in a problem definitely matters a little bit more than mm. brilliant maneuvers. So next quote, audacity, audacity, always audacity. You know, there again, we've already talked about like, what if Lucas had been more aggressive? Could that have, what if he had landed first armor division or comic Command A on the, on the first day, could that have helped set the scene at, you know, take the uh, surprise achieved in the landings and really turn that into operational success. It's a, it's a, it's a, what if, but it, it, it does beg the question uh, of that. We already kind of talked the intelligence and culmination points and logistics yeah. already. The other thing I want to talk about kind of bottom, synchronization operations. You know, Anzio single is meant to correspond with the, the breaking of the Gustav line. But when that operation fails, shingle still goes ahead with the assumption that they'll pull forces off of the line to, you know, reinforce or stop the Anzio uh, beachhead. Instead, the Germans just pull in more. And so there's a serious question up until the breakout of how is the army, how is fifth corps or excuse me, fifth army synchronizing operations between their two corps effectively on these two fronts. Right. Like, and I, and I have a serious question of how the, the army commander is, is doing that. So yeah. And I want to just highlight Benjamin's comment. Yeah. Here, like maneuver and attrition are not necessarily exclusive. It's not and, or right. It is not yeah. a, and I'm sorry if it came off that way. It is not an and, or it is just, yeah. In some cases, and sometimes one is more effective than the other, uh, but it is not a black and white, like you must do attrition or you must do maneuver. It's not. It's how do you flow between those two standpoints and when do you know to use those effectively? And I would add, but although I don't agree with this, do we sometimes use the R oh, but we attrited the enemy as a kind of a post event yeah. excuse? I mean, that's that's the, the Montgomery argument in Normandy, isn't yeah. it? Yes, we weren't very fast, but look how many German divisions he smashed before he did move on. And I, and I, I don't agree with that. I think you do have to attrit the enemy. But is is that something that people, historians, use as an excuse for la a lack of ground performance? Ah, oh, yes, but look at the toll we took on the enemy. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of, of searching for victory uh, in the mix in the midst of something that didn't go well. Uh, it, the question there's a there's a real question of how do you measure the success of an operation, right? 
fundamentally, did you achieve the thing you wanted to do? Well, yeah. Anzio, Anzio fundamentally wanted to turn the goose offline, right? Get the Germans to, you know, conduct an development to cause the Germans to displace from defenses along the goose offline by outflanking them. Did Anzio achieve that? No. However, did we, you know, pull in German reinforcements from Yugoslavia yeah. and Southern yeah. France and North? And like, yes, we did that, but that wasn't the operational intent. Can we say that's a, you know, a good thing? Yeah. But the operation also didn't achieve the thing you wanted it to actually do. And so, yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, Woody. I think our official histories are a little kinder uh, when we say, oh, well, yeah, we, we pulled a lot of German forces off of stuff. Uh, some other historians, I'll, I'll Holly Blunson again, like he's pretty critical. It's like, no, this operation or more contemporary stuff, uh, you know, more like, hey, yeah, no, no, we this failed in its intent. Uh, yeah. But it still accomplished this thing. So does that kind of answer your question? It does. And it, and it, it, it remains complicated. That's that. That's why these battles are are fun, quote unquote, to discuss because there aren't neat answers to some of these questions. You can. Uh, it's it's what makes it cool. But um, back back to you. Then we'll do the questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so last two fallacy of surprise and mass and tempo. These are interrelated. We consistently see with Clark uh, and his subordinate commanders this idea that like achieving surprise is all important. Right, no reconnaissance, no ground reconnaissance of the Anzio beachheads, right? Orion Ariel, no real reconnaissance along the Rapido River. Uh, this idea that, oh, well, we'll or, or even with Task Force Allen, Combat Command B's attack on, on Mount Porkchia, uh, south of Casino, like we'll achieve surprise. It's and, and surprise will then induce shock into the opponent, and shock will allow us to achieve our, our thing. It, there's a question of like how much surprise can you really achieve? Anzio achieved surprise, right? Like lack of prep. But every time you try and achieve surprise, you're also assuming risk because you're because you're not prepping the objective. You're not getting clear intelligence of what's going on. You're not setting the conditions to achieve your achieve what you want to do because you're hoping that surprise will or you're planning surprise will will do that. And so I say fallacy because I think commanders that this demonstrated in Italy had a real propensity to say, well, 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 it'll be a surprise attack. You see it with the Rangers, right, uh, outside Cisterna, right? Like, well, they'll infiltrate and they won't be detected and then we'll achieve surprise and that'll cause the enemy to displace. What happens when you don't achieve surprise? What's the backup plan? Um, and that's, I guess, to the importance of like mass and tempo. Mm -hmm. Like Sometimes it does take, you know, surprise paired with, you know, massive forces and high operational tempo or aggressive operational tempo to really achieve the things you, you want to do. And sometimes you got to, you know, uh, instead of not having a preparatory artillery bombardment because you want to achieve surprise, sometimes you got to, you just got to hit the guys with massed artillery 10 minutes before you step off and then you go, you know, very World War One kind of style, yeah. but it works, right? Like, yeah. so something to be said for works. Okay, uh, that ends kind of the slide deck, uh, everybody. So welcome any questions, Paul, anything you've got or anything else in the, the comments, love to ask um, and answer. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll do the questions. Um, so um, uh, some of them are quick and some of them are a little bit longer. So Samuel is saying, did the first AD capture Anzioani? Was it, was it one of their battle honors capturing it? Oh, there's a great picture of them uh, on Anzio and Annie, but I'm not entirely sure if they they actually ca if it was 180 that captured the gun. I would have to think though. I'm gonna I'm gonna take that as a, a question and come back to that one. Come about that. It, it, well, well played for for not just immediately claiming it. Uh, yeah. Given that that's your yes, it was us. It was definitely us. Well, well, well balanced. Um, we'll come back to that. And when you were talking about the Shermans being used in indirect fire, Michael is asking. Uh, did they have forward observers or scouts to implement when the, that that um, asset? Yeah, they did. They absolutely did. So you know, most of these, most of the tanks that got employed with that were again they're behind the front line. They're in these you know Italian farmhouse villages or Italian farmhouses or near them. They're behind at least concealment uh, and firing at a high angle. And they're you know they're on the radio with the infantry company or battalion headquarters that's helping them call in that artillery. You know that indirect fire. Yeah, absolutely. All most of these fires are are observed. Okay, thank you. And then this, I'm going to reword Peter's question slightly differently. You were talking about the the difficulty we're dealing with minefields, and um, yeah. it's fair to say that, or is it fair to say that Italy didn't get the gadgets that normally got all the stuff that they're kind of 
building as a force, the you know, the fannies that the British use and the mm-hmm. flail tanks and all that generally is all that Gucci kit, as we would say in England, being reserved for Normandy. And and Italy is just, well, we've got this old stuff, it'll do. Yeah, I think it absolutely is. I didn't see anything in the at least the after action reports that would, you know, specify they got, you know, some of that that Gucci kit, the the Hobart's funnies, the specific, the specific like mine clearing and breaching vehicles that that Normandy gets. I think there's two reasons for that. One, resourcing to the Italian theater uh, is low, right? So First Armored essentially got reorganized in Tunisia, and then one, what it gets in Italy is what it's what it's got. Um, two, the Allies are continually learning lessons. And I talked about this in my last video, but the Allies have a really robust lessons learned practice where they're learning from each of these operations. And in this one, they really learn the importance of, of mine clearing and you know the, the need for that stuff. And they kind of already knew it from the Dieppe raids earlier and you know other actions, but like the German employment of minefields really ups the ante in Italy. Yeah. And they learn from this and they're like, okay, well, hey, we gotta, we gotta develop specialty tech because Normandy's the, the big show yeah. so to speak, and it's gotta go and we can't run into these things. For what 1AD does, um, they develop those like organic stuff, much like you see in Normandy with the hedgerow busters that the guys yeah, like weld yeah. on the front of the tanks. Soldiers are incredibly, you know, innovative. They will innovate because their lives depend on it. And so they develop the things like the line breaching charges, the snakes, the, the larger uh, platforms that put on their treads. They can go cross country in this muddy terrain and they develop it, but it's nothing standardized, nothing like top down like the Hobart's funnies are. Well, it's a good point because we had Arthur Glaxon a couple of years ago talking about the Canadian armor and how they specifically devised in Italy what I'm going to call the triage system for the recovery of tank hulls on the battlefield. That immediate assessment where you look at a, 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 part, a knocked out Sherman and say, can this be recovered? Is there anything on it, off it we can we can salvage, repair others? And that initial assessment. And that was all developed into doctrine for Normandy from Italy. Uh, so... So you're absolutely right that Italy was was a big a big um, training ground in terms of developing tactics and ideas to use elsewhere. But um, yeah, it doesn't make it uh, very much fun for the guys actually in in theater there. No, a more questions. Yeah, for the lived experience of the soldier, it's like really great you learned that. But I could really use a mind clear. It's a bit you hadn't learned that before I got here, rather than yeah. after I got here. But that but that's w- without without um, the Allies and the Axis not learning quickly enough we wouldn't have anything to discuss on this channel so (laughs) it it at least gives us something to talk about so i got a couple more questions so um james murphy is saying um is there any single commander guilty of dithering uh, breaking out of anzio when they could have achieved rome much or is this a myth i mean we talked about um yeah um lucas and clark are we a bit bogged down on the idea that that opportunities were lost or would it have not been possible it you know, I'm not going to satisfy the gentleman's answer by saying it depends. Um, <laughs> That's it, a lot of politically correct. You're right. It, 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 so many, like a number, there's definitely two camps, right? There's there's the camp that says Lucas is solely responsible, like single commander. You were the core commander at the beachhead. Ergo, like you failed to break out. You weren't aggressive enough. There's that camp. Like Blumson falls into it. A couple others, you know, uh, Blunton kind of straddles the line, but like a couple other like big name historians fall in that that camp. Then there's the other camp. Um, that says like, hey, it, it kind of was the, the climate of the command. Like Lucas really got mixed signals from Clark, who got mixed signals from Alexander. There's that whole American-British dynamic going on in the Mediterranean. And Lucas was just the guy at the you know, at the tip of the spear that was trying to interpret these, you know, these conflicting guidances from his hire. And he did the best, he did the best he can, right? Like going back to that quote of like, Hey John, don't stick your neck out because I got you know, like I got I did it at Salerno and I got you know I got in trouble. Sidebar from a historiography part, like he writes that later. He writes that on the twenty fourth uh, of January, nineteen forty four, in his diary. So like, like a little bit of like, hey, is he just writing that afterwards, or it was it a legitimate conversation between Clark? No, uh, interesting I, stuff. I, uh, I don't, yeah, that, there were various quote comments about. If they had got to Rome earlier, if there had been a column going, would they have would they have been isolated? Would it have worked? And you're into that, you can't prove anything. You it, all we can do is discuss it in a pub and say, well, maybe, well, maybe, well, maybe. It's the, the well, yeah, get- it, it's all about like what what were you trying to achieve, right? Like everyone's like, well, because they keep achieved Rome. Well, Rome is just a city. 
Like what, yeah. what, like what is, what does it mean outside of the symbol of a city being like, well, it's a lot of roads going to Rome. Okay. So it's a transportation hub like Bastogne would be, or, you know, yeah. St. Lowe. Um, but like, what else does Rome get you? It gets a moral effect of like, Hey, well, we got the Italian capital first access capitals down, but you know, what are you really trying to, to do in Italy? And this kind of speaks to the larger strategic question of like, what are you trying to do in Italy? You're trying to tie down Germans. Are you trying to destroy, you know, the ninth and the 10th armies? Are you trying to capture Rome? What are you trying to, to do? And so if you take the assumption, yeah, we, let's go to Rome because it, we want to achieve the political and moral effect of it, of taking an Axis capital, would they have been cut off? Yes, I think they they would have been. Would that have turned into a you know a really violent urban fight? You know, somewhere along Route Seven between Rome and you know and the Gustav Line, yeah, um, could have been crushed. Yes, but but again, like now we're working. You know, what would the Germans have done if that was the case? And then, and then you've got to add the whole what would Hitler have thought? Because you know we know from the Eastern Front that Hitler can get quite obsessed about cities. Yeah, um, and and throw all his resources in even beyond when it he shouldn't have done so but you we can't speculate we can't we well we can speculate but we can't speculate with any authority so um we'll we'll, yeah. we'll move on from that it's a fantastic we've got a couple of last sort of theoretical questions for you yeah, so, um trent Alenko, uh was there any contingency planning for anzio that used airborne troops to support sixth corps yeah, there was. So the initial planning for Shingle envisioned, had an initial idea of dropping, I think the 82nd Airborne Division onto, onto Rome. Um, and it was the idea of kind of like what we did in Normandy, like you drop airborne forces behind and you'd bring it. They also had the idea of like, well, let's drop airborne forces onto the beachhead, you know, forward, kind of like what we did in Sicily, where 82nd went in yeah. behind the main landings and then the landings came. Um, but again, they looked at transferred assets. They looked at the responsiveness of the Germans and they said like, hey, this isn't, this isn't worth the squeeze because the risk to the airborne is like, we're going to like the airborne is going to get decimated. Uh, again, it's the same calculus you see at Normandy, like, but again, the risk versus reward calculus that a commander has to weigh, it's worth it in Normandy. And, and also, I, I think we're also adding the fact that we now know that the airborne jumps in Normandy went pretty well generally. The varsity was very, very good. Market Garden, perhaps not so. Yeah. But after, post Sicily, po that the airborne yeah. forces had, had, were a mixed bag so the commanders aren't considering them as a necessary kind of game changer that we would oh airborne send the airborne that's that's right. modern post-war thinking of oh send in the airborne they're fantastic um and i'm not saying the airborne weren't fantastic but i'm saying that in 1943 early 44 they've got a bit of a um it's not that the, the airborne soldiers aren't good the allies haven't yet worked out quite what to do with them yeah, because you see the 82nd's experience in, in Sicily, right? And you see, I don't know if they, I don't can't remember right off the top of my head, they go into Salerno, but they go into Sicily. And it's like, eh, it's not that great. Like, I mean, it works, uh, but there's a lot of things to, to learn from it. Same thing with the African jumps uh, or the Definitely. North African jumps, excuse me. And so there's a question of like, hey, with any airborne operation, I'm going to assume a certain percentage of casualties of my force. Is that worth the risk? you know, for what I can achieve. If yeah. I can achieve the same effect by putting those paratroopers, which they do eventually, they put them on, you know, LC, you know, LCIs and they land them on the beachhead with boats. Can I achieve the same effect by another method of infiltration? Because ultimately airborne, in addition to the, all the, the rah-rah, Siskumba stuff, and, and by the way, I'm not an airborne guy, I'm an air assault mm -hmm. guy, so take that for a grain of salt. Uh, it's, a, it's, a may, it's a way to get to the battlefield. Once they get yeah. to the battlefield, they are elite light infantry. And so yeah. how you get them to the battlefield is all about what effect you're trying to achieve. And again, we're building a force for Operation Overlord. And if you, uh, if they use airborne forces in Anzio and it all goes horribly wrong, you can't suddenly, you know, go go to Walmart and buy a new airborne division and bring it yeah. home. With you. It's uh, that, that yeah, it, it, a long time to create. Yeah, it, Trent, Trent's got a good comment there to uh, or Mr. Tela Tanako. Like he's like, hey, an airborne unit on the Alban Hills would have been useful. I actually kind of tend to agree with that, particularly if you had put the armor division, if you'd put combat command A in, in lieu of one of those infantry divisions on the first lift. And then when you get to the beachhead, you've got that mobile striking power to really get out of the, the bridgehead and link it with those airborne forces, I think that would have been a really, if, I, if I'm doing Matt Graham's counterfactual, like Anzio thing, I think that would have been a really good uh, operational plan.
but that's into the general thing that we're all very good. I mean, me and my mate Colin in Bayer, uh, when we're looking at the things, some of the things that went wrong in Normandy, we can easily cure it in the pub over a couple of pints yeah. of Guinness because we've got 80 years of historiography and information. We go, don't do that, do that, make sure you go that way, not that way, sorted, another pint. It's it's easy. Yeah. Under yeah. morning quarterbacking, uh, I suppose. But one one last kind of interesting question I hadn't I'd not thought about from Samuel. Um, has the presenter run into Allied plans to use mustard gas after the landing mm. of Anzo, thinking of the Bari Liberty ship sinking full of mustard gas? And uh, mm. yeah, has that come up in your research? No, uh, I haven't seen that yet. Um, now, part of my re- most of my research was focused at the the division yeah. level and below for this presentation, and I think any employment of you know mustard gas would have been at least at the core, if not the strategic. Uh, level because of the implications from World War One, which you know, yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those assets that we know the Allies knew they had it, and the Germans right. know have it as well, and and yeah, there's this collective idea. Yeah, it's a collective taboo, right? Of like, yeah, well, let's not cross like, that line. Um, yeah, like, we're not going to do it first. You're not going to do it first. But if you do it first, then it's game. It's game on. Yeah. yeah. So it's that collective. And yeah, everybody taboo. carried gas masks till the right last. You know, the Germans are still rolling out those fluted steel gas mask tube can- canisters right up the end of the war. The British, Americans, okay, most GIs have thrown out the gas mask and are using it to keep bubble gum and cigarette. But yeah. The, Theoretically, everybody's still deploying with a gas mask uh, defense right till you know the close of play, but that's another subject for the day. But we will leave things there because I'm about to cough my guts up. It's been fantastic talking to you, Matthew. I can't wait to come have you back again and we can take, take on the uh, the next campaign if you want to. Yeah, whenever you've got anything involved in the first armor division, um, or you just want to take like a practitioner standpoint at a, at a battle or anything like that, be happy to come on, Woody. And thanks for again for having me. And folks, thanks for their questions online. Really appreciate that. That's a great question today, folks. So, folks, I will see you all again on Monday. This is Paul Woodads for World War II TV and Matthew Graham saying enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Cheers.